begin by saying that that is totally true. I'm really excited to be here, and I have to say I'm just as lost in the building as I was when I was here last. So, but um, it's great to be here, and it was great to speak to a number of you earlier, um, uh, sort of have more an informal conversation with some of the students. Um, uh, that already uh, made it worth it. Um, so I'm trying a PowerPoint. I don't do PowerPoints a lot, and you can see I'm inexperienced because I chose gray as a color. It might be because you know the topic isn't all that cheerful, but um, it's um, the other thing is I'm going to be flipping pages here and parts, so hopefully I can keep track of what I have on the screen. What I um, want to also say before I start the formal presentations, I want to thank Ryan and Valerie and the um, um, folks who are making international law happen at, at Western and putting it on the map uh, for inviting me here. I'm really excited to be the inaugural speaker. I consider that to be a genuine honor and I'm just really glad to be here and be able to have a conversation um, with all of you and um, you can be assured that um, I think all across the country we're actually really watching what's going on in international law at Western because there's lots of you now so that's great. Um, so what I want to do uh, today is to um, offer you my reflections on international law in the age of populism, a bit of a catchy title. Um, and I want to start um, hopefully delivering on that title in a kind of risky, boring way, which is with quotes. And some of them are a little bit long, so if you bear with me, let me see whether that works. So it did work. Um, so the first quote, I'll read it out as well, given the social and political situation as well, which the international lawyer is powerless to alter, the continued fiction of universal validity of all rules can only do harm to the progress of international law. Such growth as is possible in the world today will be that of partial, not universal law. That's number one. Number two, we need to use the United Nations Security Council and believe that preserving law and order in today's complex and turbulent world is one of the few ways to keep international relations from sliding into chaos. The law is still the law, and we must follow it whether we like it or not. Under current international law, force is permitted only in self-defense or by decision of the Security Council. Anything else is unacceptable under the UN Charter and would constitute an act of aggression. Number three, the world is not a global community, but an arena where nations, non-governmental actors, and businesses engage and compete for advantage. And number four, the future does not belong to globalists. The future belongs to patriots. The future belongs to sovereign and independent nations. Now, I'll keep you guessing for the moment as to who I am quoting. I'll get to that as I go along, although some of you may have recognized some of these quotes already. Um, all of these quotes, I think, reflect serious challenges to international law and to the aspiration of a global rule of law, however imperfect and difficult it may be to achieve. Um, interestingly, these quotes actually come from different historical periods, and I'll get to that as well. I think we all sense right now, and I would say based on the conversation I had with some of you earlier, that seems to be the case here as well, that what we're seeing right now is more corrosive and potentially more dangerous than what we've seen in some time. And we might also have a hunch possibly that these current challenges to international law are connected to the rise of populism that we see around the world, including in particular in Western democracies. And so what I want to do with you today is explore that terrain by placing these challenges that we are witnessing right now into a slightly larger historical, social, and political context. And I built this exploration on the proposition that for an international legal order to exist, it has to provide universally applicable principles of conduct and interaction. And those principles, I would suggest, also have to include those that define what counts as law in the first place, and that enable and also discipline 
argumentation and justification that is legal in nature. And so Ryan referred to my work with Stephen Toop. So here I'm actually drawing directly on that work on interactional law because um, what we have been arguing and um, the account that we've been developing suggests that um, there are distinctive and we would say also constitutive traits of law and legal interaction. And more specifically, we suggest that there are certain requirements of legality. And uh, Ryan mentioned law and force, so we've drawn actually interestingly on a domestic law theorist, US-based um, legal theorist, who suggested that law is a kind of interaction and that its legal quality comes from the specific traits that legality has. And the traits, if I mention them to you, you will all recognize. There are things like generality, promulgation, non-retroactivity, clarity, non-contradiction, relative constancy over time, not asking impossible things, and also congruence between the law that exists and official action. So in a sense, they're kind of rule of law criteria. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we've drawn on Fuller, because he um, articulated these criteria in an influential and I think very tangible way. So what we suggest is that these kinds of parameters for um, legal interaction are the parameters that, are, that need to be shared for us to determine whether something counts as a legal norm or whether a given argument can count as a legal argument. So in a sense, these parameters provide a background knowledge is what you're all learning here that you will take for granted in the backs of your heads um, that are necessary for legal practices to occur and for, a, for actors to be able to recognize what they're doing as a legal interaction or legal argumentation. Now, what's important for generally, I think, but in the context of international law in particular, it's another reason why we um, found this work interesting, is that these requirements themselves are thin, if you will. And what I mean by that, in fact, Fuller called them procedural. Um, to indicate that. I'm not quite sure that's the right label, but the idea is they do not pre presuppose particular values and outcomes aside from nonetheless important values like communication, transparency, autonomy, and I would say also pluralism. Right? That's what they're supposed to promote, but they're not thick substantive values. And so Yes, this understanding of legality rests on a certain liberal moral values, if you will, but at the same time, this thinness of these parameters means that we can have a universal legal order, even if we don't all agree on thick liberal values, like, say, for example, human rights, right off the bat. Right? It's that we, first of all, create the foundation that we can have a conversation in legal terms, and then we determine what we want to put into that. Um, uh, order. So we've come to think then of international law as interactional law and what we suggest this perspective highlights is that the traits of legality and the international legal order have emerged from and are maintained by practice. And importantly, and that's a point I'll come back to, that's true for specific norms and rules within the order. Um, and that means um, that making and maintaining and changing international law is a collective process with many different participants. We talked earlier about what can everybody do. Well, I would say, of course, we assume states and international organizations and maybe, maybe courts are involved in international lawmaking, but I think it includes NGOs and individuals and a whole spectrum of actors that can at least push back or ask for justification and participate in this process. Now, we also think that this interactional law is actually surprisingly resilient in part because many actors can defend and strengthen it. But, and that now gets me to the less optimistic part, when norms are widely challenged and when they're no longer effectively defended, they will change or decay. And that's also true, and that's the part, in a sense, that worries me most for the principles and criteria that underpin international law itself. So I would say the first kind of change, the change to particular norms, that's inherent or even necessary in law. Right? The resilience, if you will, of the legal system depends on its capacity to change and the capacity for 
um, particular norms that we um, share to change. And if you look throughout the 20th century, the substance of international law, especially in terms of its assertion of universal values, has been hotly contested. And that's not surprising, right? The, the world changed significantly over this period of time, and there was a lot to contest. With lots of examples, you will all be able to think of some, but let me point just at decolonization and all the attendant challenges and changes to a purportedly universal legal order that was, in fact, Eurocentric and exclusionary. Right? And that's evident when you look at early 20th century conceptions like civilization, statehood, recognition. There's you know, the examples above. And still, I would suggest to you, notwithstanding all the change that has happened over this period of time, notwithstanding pointed attacks on the substance of international law or even its operation in particular settings, the basic understandings that underpin a universal conception of law as opposed to specific norms, they, it seems to me, have remained more or less unchallenged or they have continued to function. And so what I'm concerned about now and why, and I come back to the beginning, we all have a sense that something is going on that isn't so good. So why I'm worried is because it seems to me what we see now isn't just file, uh, fights about particular rules and institutions. We see those, of course. But it's actually sustained challenges and growing challenges to what I would call the underpinnings of international law. And that concerns me because the importance of a shared notion of legality lies not just in providing space for a measure of diversity and pluralism and a kind of platform for the development of common purposes, but perhaps most importantly, that context provides a setting in which, um, or it's a setting that enables and also <coughs> guides relatively ordered interaction in the absence of agreement or even in the event of conflict, right? That's also an important role that international law plays. So since World War II, multilateralism has been the dominant mode of the international legal order, but now we see that international law and multilateralism are under siege. So what's going on? What's happening? Now, to some extent, one might say that the current dynamics could be understood as just a recalibration. Right? We're, we're kind of coming back down to earth from the optimism of the early 1990s. And in some ways, you might say, maybe what we're seeing is a reckoning with the possibly inflated assumptions about the common purposes and common values and shared norms that we thought existed, but really maybe they weren't as real as, as we thought um, in that period. It's also possible that the more forcefully multilateralism was deployed in the name of Western liberal institutionalism, the more tenuous it became over time. And of course, also, we know history did not end, as some suggested, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. So this, we're now all, we all agree moment went by, and we can see very clearly that that's um, not the case. So the upswing in international lawmaking in the early 1980s and early 1990s maybe was the high point of what was achievable, because in actual fact, the shared ground um, that we assumed was much more limited and more fragile than it seemed. So that's one possible reading, and that may play into this. Um, I would certainly say that as much as we had this kind of up moment of optimism, it's certainly the case that um, historical grievances have continued to simmer in large parts of the world regarding what you might say are preferences and inequities baked into the international legal order. And maybe that wasn't so obvious, or maybe we just ignored it when it was Western states, in particular the United States, that were able to shape and drive the international agenda. Maybe we could just afford to not look so closely, right? Question worth asking. And then the diversification of international society, both through the emergence of new states with very different needs, capacities, outlooks, through the rise of business and civil society actors, and even terrorist networks, 
All of that posed challenges to that agenda, but it seems to me until relatively recently, it still sort of was business as usual, right? We just take things for granted and carry on. So what has changed? Why does it seem, at least to me, that we're at a sort of crossroads now? Now let me put it in very pointed and admittedly also broad brush strokes at the same time. That is, what I want to suggest is that there are two different challenges to international law that we're seeing at the moment, and both emanate from notions of sovereignty. But I think they emanate from two different, very different conceptions of sovereignty. On the one hand, what we see are challenges that reassert sovereignty and principles designed to protect and give effect to sovereignty. And those challenges then entail efforts to retrench international law, to pull back from the more value-laden, liberal international law, so to pull back from human rights, interventionism, and so on. So that's one. On the other hand, I think we see challenges that emanate from what you might label populist sovereignty. And we can have a long discussion about whether that label is right and what exactly populism is, but let me just put it out there. I will elaborate on this, of course, but roughly the argument is that actually these, the second type of challenge is the much more dangerous challenge to international law because these are the challenges um, to which I've just referred a little earlier, that is, these are challenges that don't just target the values that we might like or not like in international law, they challenge legality itself. That's why I think they're more worrisome. So if I put it differently, we may not like the first type of challenge, nor should we necessarily, right? We should want to defend human rights and all those things that um, uh, have been promoted and accomplished. Um, and it may also be that the first type of challenge in some instances converges with the second. So there's lots of gray here. It's not all black and white. But I would put to you that the first type of challenge doesn't inherently challenge the existence of international law as a thin legal order or a thin framework for legal interaction, right? It's about, it's a challenge to the content more. The second type of challenge though, I think, the one grounded in populist sovereignty is dangerous because it's fueled by a notion of sovereignty that I think at least is ultimately incompatible with the idea of legality. Why? Because the idea of legality as I've sketched it at the beginning, necessarily implies a pluralism that I think is antithetical to this populist notion of sovereignty that I'm talking about. And again, I'm just putting it out there and we can discuss um, whether that is uh, you know, overdrawn or not enough nuance on what different types of populism um, there are. So these two dynamics that I've um, highlighted, I think find expression in the, in or these, these two phenomena find expression in two major dynamics. So the first one, this challenge um, uh, to retrench toward a more conventional sense of sovereignty, um, I think coincides with the rise of major regional or possibly even global powers outside the West, right? China, India, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and an increasingly aggressive, at least resurgent, Russia. And the key dimension of this power change, I think, is economic. And it's reflected in the idea that we have a rise of major new economies, especially in China and India. On that is a thin little book that I picked up when I was traveling once last year. Very interesting and indeed provocative, and I'll let that speak for itself as I uh, go on to say, but some people actually say, pay attention, because this isn't just something that will pass, we are in for um, a major change. But whichever way that goes, there is a shift in balance, and some of that shift in balance is economic. Other aspects of this shift focus specifically on international law. So for example, Russia is explicitly looking to promote a post-Western world order. China calls it a little more neutrally a new world order, but they, the two actually agree on some of the core features of this desired order. And they've put that out there publicly in 2016. China and Russia adopted a joint declaration on the promotion of international law, and there they articulated a thin conception of international law, 
focused on the UN Charter, but emphasizing sovereignty-based principles like non-intervention, state and unity, and so on. So in a sense, returning to a kind of a law of coexistence and stripping out liberal internationalism, de-emphasizing human rights talk. So that, I think, is a concrete illustration of this sort of state sovereignty retrenchment that I mentioned a moment ago. But as I also suggested, it's the second of the two dynamics that I find more concerning. I would suggest to you that the most destabilizing challenges to international law and multilateralism are coming from within the West. And most specifically, I think, for a range of reasons, they come from the United States. Um, since the inauguration of President Donald Trump, the US government has adopted an increasingly unilateralist, transactional posture. And so that posture is well captured in one of my opening quotes. Some of you may have recognized it. So the quote about the global arena where we trade for advantage comes from May 2017, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and two high profile at the time, no longer, advisors to President Donald Trump, who basically articulated this transactional view of what international law is. And at that time already, but certainly since then, we've seen accumulating actions, um, the administration's moves through trade wars with other major economies, withdrawal from the UN Human Rights Council, um, the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, now official, officially notified, um, the push for withdrawal from a range of treaties that provide dispute settlement by international tribunals, and so on and so on. So it seems as if the administration in the United States at least has turned against multilateralism and perhaps turned against international law. Now, some of the challenges that emanate from the US do focus on the substance of international law, and they target actually norms that are fairly fundamental to the order that we've known since World War II, right? Rights of refugees from conflict zones, the prohibition on torture, the prohibition on the use of force, we talked over lunch the rules of the world trading system, and so on. So there's a, a long list. Um, but also, um, what I want to add to this is that this sense that assumptions about globally shared norms may have been overly optimistic to me is heightened by the fact that the same questioning of what one might have thought were robust norms also occurs within relatively homogeneous Western societies. Now you know why my slides are great, right? <laughs> um, so over the last few years, norms around gender equality, violence against women, LGBT rights, racial tolerance, you name it, all of that has come under siege within major Western, some major Western democracies. Um, and I think even though I want to be heartened after the federal election that we just had, I don't think we're immune to this in Canada here either, right? It seems to be happening everywhere. But it doesn't end there. We are also seeing, I think, increasingly open and pointed challenges to the very idea of international law and to the principles that animate the idea of an international rule of law. And what's troubling is that these challenges coincide, to my mind at least, with the increasingly cavalier or even dismissive fashion in which some leading politicians in Western democracies undermine the checks and balances of domestic law. We had a taste of this, at least an attempted taste of this, right here in Ontario, right? When the newly elected Ontario Premier last year said uh, that uh, he didn't see why the views of unelected judges should prevail over those of the elected representatives of the people. And so that's that is what, you know, technically speaking, what he was proposing to do when voting the notwithstanding clause is perfectly okay. Well, not okay, but it's possible. But it wasn't within the spirit of the checks and balances of the system, in the spirit, I would suggest, of uh, the rule of law. But the upshot is that challenges to international law, and that's the important point for my purposes here, they're not just a matter of souring on multilateralism or a new spin 
on concerns about international law's legitimacy or democracy deficits. Instead, what I think is happening is that international law is getting caught up in broader patterns of disdain for the ideals of the rule of law, generality, equality before the law, even-handedness, subjecting of government to the law, all of those things. Now, obviously, these ideals aren't fully realized even in our domestic societies at all points in time, right? And certainly not um, at the international level. But that's not actually the complaint, right? That's not the complaint. The complaint is that the pursuit of those ideals stands in the way of the preferred policies. That's the complaint of this kind of um, stance. And that's what I think makes these new challenges to international law so dangerous and so difficult to counter. They are wrapped up in and fueled by broader social and political dynamics in Western states and a trend toward populism, for lack of a better word. Now, there are um, many people who have looked at this closely. Uh, there are two US-based political scientists, Ronald Inglehart and Pippa Norris, who have looked very closely at the rise of populism. If this is interesting to you, there is a doorstopper of a book that came out this year. It's called Cultural Backlash, Trump, Brexit, and Authoritarian Populism. <coughs> Maybe that's the populism I'm worried about now that I read that. Where they document this across a range of countries. Um, not just the US, but um, several other places as well. So based on extensive surveys and historical evidence, what they show is that people who take material security for granted are more open to new ideas and more tolerant of outsiders. Conversely, a sense of insecurity, real or not, but a sense of insecurity makes people less tolerant of others and more likely to line up behind authoritarian leaders who purport to defend in-group security against outsiders. We talked earlier about how issues like climate are often connected to other issues like um, a distrust of migrants and so on. So I think that's what um, this points to. So what these two, Inglehart and Norris, argue is that Western post-World War II societies actually evolved accordingly, um, that they became increasingly more open, um, but that then there was a backlash against what they describe as post-material values like freedom of expression, gender equality, environmental protection, tolerance of foreigners. Post-material because once security, sense of security has been attained, we can afford those values, and now there is a backlash against them. What they show, though, is that, of course, that these fears aren't entirely new, but the sense of stagnation and insecurity among ever-growing segments of Western populations has powered the rise of populist leaders and self, or populist parties and self-declared strong leaders. And I think we can see that playing out in more and more countries in the West, elsewhere as well, of course. Um, and it connects to a phenomenon that have many of you seen this, the famous or infamous elephant graph, Marko Milanovic. Um, so what this graph illustrates is a part of that picture that I've just sketched, and that is that although most of the world's population made income gains between, in his case he looked at 1988 to 2008, the largest total gains were made by people living in emerging economies. Remember my earlier comment about the rise of new economies? That's the body of the elephant. But then the greatest absolute gains fell to ultra-rich people in Western states. That's the trunk that's sticking up on as it's doing it on this side. Now, there's a more recent study that revisits the um, territory of Milanovic's study. And it actually spans a larger period of time, 1980 to 2016. And what this study suggests is that the body of the elephant has actually flattened out um, with fewer gains of the vast majority of people. And if you look at the right, you will also see, you can read the fine print if you can, you can see all the details, but the idea is that the top 10%, they've broken up into smaller segments to show that it is actually the top 1% of income earners that make 27% of total income gain between 1980 to 2016. And in Western industrial societies, income 
inequality, of course, declined for most of the 20th century, but since 1970, and this comes back to England and Norris, they show that it's been on the rise quite steeply in, in our own societies. And they suggest that these phenomena, income inequality, and <coughs> economic insecurity, or a sense of economic insecurity, will only increase, and here's even more cheerful, when AI really gains full steam, we're going to have more of this, um, not less of this. I'll leave that aside. Now, already you might be wondering, am I still giving the right talk? What does all of this have to do with international law? Well, I think it does have something to do with it, and because what I'm trying to suggest to you is that these developments are closely connected to the backlash against international law that we see in parts of the Western world. Because on the one hand, that's something you hear often said, that international law is implicated in globalization, migration, all of the things that growing segments of Western populations believe accounts for these economic problems. Right? But my point really is that the problem is much more fundamental than that. More and more people are prepared to put their faith in populism and perceived strong leadership. And as that happens, the rule of law comes to be seen as an obstacle and not a protector. Right? In law school, we're used to understanding the rule of law as something that is there to protect the weak, everybody, more or less equally to the best, at least that's the best intention. But it comes to be seen by many people as an obstacle to what they want seen um, done. And so what I would suggest um, to you is that to the extent that legality is an expression of liberal ideals and pluralism, it comes to be negatively associated with these kind of post-material values of the perceived elite. So that's, at least when I read Engelhardt and Norse's study, that's the thought that came to me. Now, there is a precedent for this trajectory. My native country, Germany, during the decline of the Weimar Republic, the world economic crisis, and the rise of fascism. Certain aspects of the disdain for the rule of law today align, actually, with critiques that were articulated in Germany at the time, and perhaps most enduringly by one of the leading political theorists of the right, Karl Schmitt. At the heart of his political and legal theory was the notion of, I paraphrase, populist sovereignty. The inherent sovereignty of a homogeneous people whose power cannot be constrained by law. And what he argued was that liberalism was fatally flawed because of its inherent pluralism. And these checks and balances of the rule of law, they're ultimately, in his view, they were wrong-headed because they were threats to popular sovereignty. He also had things to say about international law, and here I grossly oversimplify, but the gist of it is that universal international law is impossible. Why? Because there is no global political community. There can't be a sovereign that could legitimate law. At best, he suggested, what we can have are spheres of influence in which states with similar political outlooks might have legal relations and fight common enemies. So any sort of purported universal international law was a tool of control, and I'm just going to make sure that I'm still on the right slide, I think I am, a tool of control used by powerful states that were trying to hide their politics behind the facade of neutrality and pluralism. That was his take on what was um, going on at the time and what, where international law fit into the picture. And so the quote with which I began my comments today, this one here, no, this one, no, now I'm actually lost. Hang on, where am I? Uh, I'm out of order, hang on, here we go. This quote um, is not someone who is bemoaning international law's dire and fragmented state today, but it comes from an article published in 1938 by a German-American international law scholar, Wolfgang Friedman. He also taught in Canada for a while, incidentally, in the 70s at the University of Toronto. So he was responding to what I've just described, this idea that at best there could be spheres of influence. And so now let me return to the present and to 
Donald Trump's take on international law. I think it's safe to say he does not even know who Carl Schmitt was. <laughs> but the impulses that underlie his politics um, are actually there. And here now I think I have to go backward because that quote about the world not belonging to globalists but to patriots, that is Donald Trump a month and a half ago at the UN General Assembly um, in New York. And I would put to you what he's talking about there isn't just regular old sovereignty, that is populist sovereignty, right? The, the point that I'm trying um, to illustrate. Now, undercutting the international rule of law, it's not all Trump, right? It predates Donald Trump because also important, I think, for us to appreciate is that major Western powers have long been hypocritical in the application of international law, ironically in much the way that Schmidt criticized, pursuing policy gain, uh, goals in the name of universality. And that's possibly why Schmidt today is actually very popular among thinkers on the left of the spectrum, because he exposes this hypocrisy or um, said to expose it. Now, what am I talking about? I think you can all imagine examples. Among the most prominent, I would say, are examples of Western interventionism abroad, where Western states assert rights to fight rogue states or terror networks to avert atrocities and human rights abuses. So the NATO bombings in Kosovo in 1999 under President Clinton. 2003 intervention in Iraq, President George W. Bush, the overstepping of Security Council authorized authority in Libya in 2011 under President Obama. Right? So this is across the political spectrum. All of these interventions were backed by other key Western states, not in all cases by Canada, by the way, and all of them were illegal, however justified one may have thought at the time they were, or even think now. And that brings me back to another one of my opening quotes. Now I have to scroll forward. This one is not from a Western international lawyer complaining about rogue state behavior, but you might be surprised to see that none other than Vladimir Putin wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in which he stood up for international law why did he do that? This was in the context of um, Obama's red line musings when he was saying chemical weapons are being used in Syria. I'm drawing a red line. If you do it again, we will intervene. Whatever one thinks about that, that actually also would have been illegal to do, whether it's right or not, a different issue. But here is Putin saying we need to stick to international law. Now, we can discuss where that comes from and what that means, but where I want to go with this is that there's been long and there is a growing and now very openly articulated dismay with the Western kind of a la carte approach to international law that informs this op-ed and you find it expressed um, um, in many, many places. Here's one example. Um, I referred earlier to the Joint Declaration on the Promotion of International Law. I won't read this out, but you can see it very um, explicit here that there is a concern about double standards. Similarly, last year in his remarks to the UN General Assembly, the <coughs> Russian Foreign Minister said this, our Western colleagues seek to replace the rule of law in international affairs with some rules-based order. These rules, which are made up as political expediency dictates, are a clear case of double standards. Now, let me be clear, I'm not suggesting that Putin's Russia has been or is a good faith actor when it comes to international law. My point is really that it's difficult to deny that at the very least this pattern of Western hypocrisy has helped weaken international law and has served to invite others to follow suit. And I would also say that even though I said this did not start with the Trump administration, that its approach to international law is of a different order than what we've seen before. Because what we see now is open dismissiveness and kind of hostile or obstructionist action. But what is lacking is the effort that was always there before to maintain the framework as such, right? to maintain the underpinnings of the system. Um, and for illustration of this slippery slope, and it seems like more and more actors are now thinking, oh, we can just get away with it. Just think, 
of what happened in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul last year. Think of using Novichok nerve agent in the UK. Now, what happened there, interestingly, I had an interesting discussion in my international law class last year about the UK response, which was sort of musing about, is this a matter for NATO or not? But let's leave that aside. But they, the UK and other Western states did eventually respond forcefully in a rhetorical sense. And I think rightfully so. But you know what the response of the Russian ambassador was? We can't take British words for granted. The UK has a bad record of violating international law and misleading the international community, which includes invading Yugoslavia, Iraq, and Libya under false pretexts, and so on, and so on, and so on. So just throwing it back at us, so to speak. Now, the pattern has continued, I think, over the last year and into this year. Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights, US recognition. Mutual military incursions, India and Pakistan, nobody even bothers to give any justification at all, right? And more and more, and most recently, the Turkish invasion into Syria, which also barely tries to give a legal justification and certainly doesn't fall within any recognizable justification. Do you know who pushed back? Liechtenstein. <laughs> Liechtenstein is the only state that I could find on October 9th saying the military in in intervention initiated in Syria today <coughs> is a stark reminder of, importance, of the importance of enforcing international law and the use of force, overly broad and unchecked interpretations of Article 51, the self-defense provision in the Charter, undermine the rules-based order we all rely on for peace and security. Liechtenstein. That's, that's it. Others said, you know, it wasn't advisable, and so on and so on. Which comes back to my interactional law point, right? It's not just that we have to be worried about violations. We also have to be concerned about maintaining and responding. So, where does this all leave us? I think the historical significance and the future implications of what's going on are not lost on anyone, and they're certainly not lost on other Western leaders. And a number of countries are trying to figure out where we go from here. Um, France and Germany, for example, uh, this summer started something they call the Alliance for Multilateralism that also tries to kind of um, promote the maintenance of the rules-based international order. Um, although they don't seem to be terribly optimistic because you will have seen Macron in the news last week saying that he thought that you know, NATO was brain dead or something, like that was the word that, that he used. And in any case, it's uncertain whether these kind of efforts to rally support for multilateralism and international law, whether they suffice to prevent the unraveling of the global order. And it's also not certain at this point to what extent non-Western states, and I would say in particular China, are going to be partners in maintaining this rules-based order that they have themselves declared themselves to be increasingly suspicious of, right? That's what they're saying. You're just playing double standards here. But even more of concern is that the Western would-be defenders of the existing international order are increasingly besieged at home. We have come back to populism and anti-legalist dynamics that I've tried to sketch. And so that's really ultimately what it comes down to. The point that I'm pitching is that international law's fate is actually very much tied to the fate of liberal democratic rule of law politics and commitment to the rule of law at home in, in Western countries. That's why I've called this international law in the age of populism and what I'm trying to suggest. Now let me leave you with a few final thoughts. So first, I think one way or another we are witnessing a change in the international order. If we assume, and I want to assume that, and ultimately I think, I believe, we will see the maintenance of multilateralism and international law. So if we assume that, I still think what we have to expect is that we will be moving to a much leaner order, one that is <coughs> anchored in norms that are increasingly promoted and shaped, or at least co-shaped, by non-Western states. And that is something that we in the West have to be seriously prepared for. We have to actually also recognize that that's an opportunity. And there is, if you are reading the international law literature, there is a growing body of literature that rightly points out that international law has to do a lot better to reflect genuinely globally shared norms. So 
possibly, you know, there are these creative destruction types who say the crisis prompts a shift to an international order that is more built around these norms, it might actually strengthen the reach and the influence of international law. Second point, the proponents of multilateralism and the rules-based order have to ensure that their efforts are underpinned by a robust and consistent defense of the rules and principles that make international law possible in the first place. So what we need isn't just a rules-based order, we need a legal order. Otherwise, what we will see is ever-escalating lawfare and the erosion of international law that's worth its name. By lawfare, I mean something that you're seeing more and more in the name of hybrid warfare that um, rules, legal rules are used for strategic purposes, for example, by pitching your attack on someone just under the threshold that would trigger um, the, the ability of um, the targeted party to respond legally. And, um, and another topic but I think that it goes hand in hand with this erosion that we're seeing. Third point, Wolfgang Friedman, again, let's see what I can get in here, here we go. So he was telling us in 1938 that there wasn't really much hope for universal international law. What he's actually most famous for is his book on the changing structure of international law, written um, in 1964, so some 25 years later, where he was saying, look at this. We are progressing from a law of simple coexistence to a law of cooperation. So he said that the structure of the international system had fundamentally changed in a very hopeful way. So there is hope. But, and that's my last point, and that I think goes to all of you here for International Law Week. As international lawyers, we have to work as hard as we can to make sure that it won't take 25 years, right? And that means, and this is something we talked about earlier in, in the smaller group discussion that I also struggle with and I don't have the answer for, but we need to figure out how we come out of our bubble and illuminate international law's importance for those who don't come to this kind of lecture uh, and those who actually doubt its bona fide or even its usefulness or its existence. And that brings me back to the beginning. International law is a collective practice. It depends on and is fundamentally shaped by constant efforts. And so as students, scholars, teachers, practitioners, and as citizens, we're all called upon to do the hard work of defending and developing international law. And that's where I'll end, and I hope that we can somehow find a way to rise to the challenge, and here's my ultimate gloomy slide. <laughs> it's not the end, it's the beginning or a point in the journey. Thank you.